Mayday, mayday, mayday. A mid-air emergency over northern England. I probably was panicking, wouldn't you? <laughs> John Wildey is faced with every passenger's worst nightmare. I'm in the P2 seat at the moment. You're in the right-hand seat. Yeah, Roger, I've got a pilot. Pilot is dead. Oh, my God. The priority is to, to keep him calm and to get him on the ground as soon as possible. Alone in a light aircraft in the pitch black. Have you done any flying before? Negative. The last five minutes were going to be the critical ones. How we actually got it onto the ground. He battles to land a plane and save his life. Don't think this is going to end well, by the way. This is not going to end well at all. I was trying to keep as calm as possible because if I didn't, I would lose everything. I wanted to live. Hundred feet up in the sky, 77-year-old John Wildey and his pilot friend are flying above the Lincolnshire countryside in a Cessna light aircraft. Well, we were having a good flight, we were enjoying it, we were picking out landmarks. It's just a day out, yeah, happiness. <laughs> it's like the last of the summer wine. We were enjoying ourselves. It's early evening and the end of a glorious day out. The two plane enthusiasts have been visiting friends at Butlins in Skegness. It was just a Saturday out flight. Um, instead of going by car, we were going by airplane. And we just had a poodle over there and uh, met them. Had a good time, really. Quite a good three or four hours chatting and listening to the music, if you like that sort of thing. <laughs> Now they're on their way back to Sandtoft Airfield in North Lincolnshire, where they took off from earlier that day. And we set course for Sandtoft. The sun was setting in the southwest and it was quite low down. Um, we'd had about another hour to run before we got to Sandtoft, and there's plenty of time to get down before daylight. John and his friend are flying through airspace controlled by Humberside Airport, where it's business as usual. Air traffic controller John Cameron is coming towards the end of his shift. It's just a, a normal day, so at work, you know, you've got the standard scheduled traffic that comes in and out, and then the, the private flights that go backwards and forwards. And the day was just quieting down towards the, uh, and winding down with the last ones uh, coming back to the roosts for the day. Up in the Cessna, John's friend, the pilot, begins to feel ill. He said he felt sick. So I said, oh, well, don't be sick of me trousers. He says, don't worry, I'll open the door and be sick outside. And I said, do you want to go in somewhere? And he said, no, I'm fine now. So we carried on. Minutes later, it becomes clear it's more than just a minor illness. He asked me to just hold the controls a bit while he leant back and he started breathing a bit uh, rapidly. He suddenly said, take control, John. And he just went into hyperventilation and then he threw his head back. And I thought he had uh, fainted or something. Because I, I said to him, are you all right, mate? Nudged him a few times, nothing. So I tried to feel for a pulse, because his hand was hanging down the side there and I couldn't feel anything. I felt his forehead, but it was very cold and clammy. And I just thought, well, what do I do now? And I thought, well, I'm going to have to fly this thing. This is a Houston, we have a problem moment. going to have to go for it and I pressed the you've got a little button on your yoke which you press to transmit 
So I pressed it. Mayday, mayday, mayday. These are the actual recordings from that night, and this is the first time John has heard them. Aircraft calling Mayday, homicide radar. Roger, this is Golf, Bravo, Charlie, Yankee, Romeo. Um, I'm a passenger, my pilot seems to be unconscious. I'm just in sight of Santos, my home base, but I'm not a pilot. Over. Makes the back of my hair curl up. <laughs> Well, it was uh, an Andy Warhol moment for me, wasn't it? Well, Brother Charlie Yankee Romeo, that's understood. Uh, and uh, are you official with Santos off that field? Yeah, Roger, I'm just going to beam a bit at the moment. The height is uh, 1300, and I haven't a clue what my speed is. Well, thank you, Romeo, Roger. Have you done any flying before? Negative. Right, this is this is a real thing. We're going to have to deal with it. Uh, yeah, this guy needs help straight away. In the next 20 seconds, something could happen. John served as a desk clerk in the RAF for 25 years. He knows some flying terminology, but has never actually flown a plane before. Oh, thank you, Romeo Roger. When you uh, move the, uh, are you able to actually control the aircraft? Do you have any experience in controlling the aircraft? Uh, Only holding this thing straight, keeping it, trying to keep it level. It can take a trainee pilot up to 30 hours of instruction before being allowed to fly solo. John is going to have to learn to do it in just a matter of minutes. Well, I had a yoke in my hand and I'm um, just sort of watching it and watching the direction. John knows only the rudimentary basics of controlling the plane, the steering yoke to steer it up, down and side to side, and the throttle to vary its speed. I can see all the instruments. One's your speed, your height, your um, angle of uh, approach, you know, the horizon. Um, you've got one that tells you if you're going up or down. Um, there's some like that deal with the engines, which I wasn't really sure of. John has no idea how to use the plane's wing flaps or rudder controls, both essential for normal flying. This guy's in trouble. The worst case scenario is a, is a plane crashes sort of in the ground in a large crater. His chances of landing and safely and walking away possibly less than 30 percent. Air traffic control decide John's best chance of survival is to head to Humberside Airport. It's 20 minutes flying time away. But if he can make it there, it will give him a chance of landing at a fully manned international airport. Are you happy to uh, transit about 18 miles to Humberside? We'll uh, give you instructions and directions from there. Will that make it easier for you? I could see the Humber Bridge in the distance. So I said, do you want me to head for North Tower and uh, go that way? He said, yeah, fine. They told me they were going to get somebody in to talk me down. And I thought that's when the fun's going to start. The, the last five minutes were going to be the critical ones as to, as to just, you know, how we actually got it onto the ground. Mark Watkin is the operations manager at Sandtoft Airport. He knows John personally and is racing towards Humberside to help out. He flew the way that I was driving. And because it was turning dusk and he got the lights on, I could actually see him. At that point, when I was driving to Humberside, I'd still got daylight, um, but I got the sun behind me. I was concerned that if we didn't get something sorted soon, we were going to um, have an issue of doing all this in the dark. What started as an innocent day out has turned into a full-blown emergency. The runways at Humberside are cleared, all inbound flights are diverted, and fire and rescue services are on alert for the incoming flight. The airport w w was cleared for the emergency to, uh, to sort of to take effect, no matter what the outcome was going to be. The John had the runways to himself. 25 minutes after the Mayday call went out, an RAF Sea King search and rescue helicopter arrives on the scene. 
Its onboard camera searches for a sighting of John Cessna. We see the search and rescue helicopter just to the north of about four miles away. Uh, Roger that, thank you. He's just crossing right to left, uh, slightly above uh, my 400 feet now. Helicopter inside this time on my left hand side. That was the first time I've ever seen anything like that. And I think we talked about it as a crew, that it was like you've been stuck in some Hollywood movie. We could hear the conversation between him and Humberside. It quickly became apparent that he didn't have any experience at all. Up to then, I'd only had voices in my ears. Now I could see something, even though it was just a flashing light and the, uh, navigation lights, but at least I could see it and roughly make out the shape of it. So I knew that at least there was somebody up there, my level, going to help me. The RAF crew set up a private radio link with air traffic control so they can coordinate the attempted landing without John being distracted by their conversation. What are we doing? Are we pulling him in or are we keeping out the way? No, we're just hopefully getting a flying instructor in who will be able to uh, provide some assistance to talk the uh, pilot down onto runway 26. Flying instructor in the next couple of minutes to provide some instruction. As John approaches Humberside Airport, the flight instructor is yet to arrive to guide him down. And the light is fading fast. Yeah, any idea how to turn the lights on on the dashboard, are they? Okay, God bless you. Anyone fly a fixed wing, Rick? Yes, I can. Turn the lights on. It's a Cessna, I've no idea where it is on that one. That's the problem. These aircraft are not like buying a car where the light switch is definitely in the same place. They're not. These aircraft have been either stripped down and rebuilt or have been modified for somebody's use in the past. Each Cessna tends to have a different uh, switching yeah. system, unfortunately. I'm not familiar with that one. Roger that. John can barely see any of his instrument dials, and flicking the wrong switch could be disastrous. The light switch is apparently near the um, ignition switch, and I could have switched all the electrics off and everything. Flicking switches that's going to cause uh, uh, something else to go off that you don't really want to do. The aircraft is stable. The last thing you want to do is upset the apple cart. While everyone worries about how John can land safely, his main concern is causing a mid-air collision. Navigation lights on. Uh, yes. Copy, Romeo. The tower advised that your navigation lights are on at this time. Navigation lights. I don't want to hit me. No, don't worry. The helicopter's pulling you around the airfield. I just didn't want them to get into trouble. You know, technical trouble, as it were. I knew they were doing their job, but I just worried that you know something would go wrong. And of course. It was my fault, in a way, that it was happening. The navigation lights on the wing mean that he can be seen by the RAF helicopter. Oh, oh bless him. Pilot's name is... I don't know about his medical history. My name is John Wildy, Whiskey to New Lima, Delta Echo Yankee. No flying experience whatsoever. Oh, I think I'm a coffee job, thank you. Well, I was gentleman, I'll always introduce myself. God, he's got a good sense of humour. Yeah, if he makes it like. down in one piece, he deserves a medal. When he makes it down in one piece. Various stages, he was almost jokey with us, and the admiration for somebody in that situation. He was 100% aware of the predicament he was in. An incredible man. If I panicked, I was going to be in the deck. So I had to keep calm. And in fact, I tried to go as calm and professional as possible. And then when I stopped communicating, I'd probably do three Hail Marys and leap up and down screaming and then sit back again. <laughs>
Finally, flight instructor Roy Murray arrives at Humberside's air traffic control. How are you? Not exactly in the best of spirits, over. Right, OK, well, my name's Roy Murray. I'm a chief flight instructor at Frank Morgan School of Flying. I'm going to get you down onto the ground, OK? That would be very helpful. Thank you very much. I didn't think anything at the time. I just got on with it. I just thought, well, we've got to get him down somehow. So let's just not panic. Let's sit back a little bit, assess the situation. Roy Murray has raced to the airport so quickly, he hasn't had time to be fully briefed. I didn't know he hadn't flown an aircraft before. No, I didn't. Right, have you flown an airplane before this time? Negative. He's in quite a lot of serious trouble. With the night sky closing in, John Wildey is approaching Humberside Airport. The airspace has been cleared and emergency services are on alert on the runway. While the RAF follow John in the air, in air traffic control, Roy Murray, a professional flight instructor, is trying to talk him through the basics of flying an aeroplane. Right, OK, well, in front of you, you've got what they call a steering wheel, or a yoke. Yeah, he's found that, Figured that bit, eh? Yeah, he's figured that bit out. He's doing quite well with that bit. Yeah, um, the only trouble at the moment is I've got no... Dashboard light, over. Right, OK, well, down by your right hand knee, there's a load of rocket switches. If you put all them up, you'll get some lights on something, and we'll be able to see it. On the ground, there is still confusion about the exact situation in the Cessna. I didn't realise which seat. I didn't even think which seat was in at the time. I'm in the P2 seat at the moment. You're in the right hand seat. Yeah, Roger, I'm not a pilot. Pilot is dead. Oh, my God. And a little bit of panic starts to creep in, I think. And I think when Roy was trying to explain the lights and had obviously suggested he was in the other seat, and it, it was a, an almost kind of panicked, my pilot's dead, you know, I'm the only one up here, somebody's got to help me. And we were worried then that he was going to start panicking, which would have made the whole situation worse. But I knew in my mind that he was dead. And I thought, well, they, if they made me chog around a bit until he come conscious again, that wouldn't help. So I just said it straight out, he was dead. Well, I thought we've got to work quick here to get him on the ground. Just hold the control column. You know where the throttle is. That's all you need to do. Fly the aeroplane, keep it level. Then. The plan is to get John to land on Humberside's shorter, unlit runway. Even though it has no lights, he'll be flying into the wind, giving him a much better chance of making a safe landing. But the light is fading fast. Panic as it gets Hello, John, this is Roy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, stand by one. So what we're going to do, we're going to turn you to the right, and then you're going to land on runway 26. Roger. Dusk getting towards nightfall. I think they had one shot to get him onto the unlit into wind runway, and that was probably the best chance to get him on before it got dark. So far, John has managed to keep the plane level. Now he's faced with an entirely more difficult and dangerous task. I was guiding the plane, if you like to say, at the moment, but uh, landing was a different proposition. You're going on the black paint runway that's not lit. Landing a plane is the most challenging part of being a pilot. It's the culmination of all their training, involving multiple technical skills and judgment, all focused on that one moment of touchdown. 
John is going to have to attempt it as a complete novice. My main interest was to get down and save myself and try and not make too much of a mess about it. Up in the sky, the RAF crew hold back to allow John a clear path into the runway. We'll just do that the way for this bit. Yeah. But they have a sense of dark foreboding. He was nowhere near lined up to start with, and they, he was suddenly on the approach. I don't think this is going to end well, by the way. This is not going to end well at all. We thought we were there for the crash, and it's a horrible thing to say, but as a search and rescue asset, there's not really a lot we can do in the air, and the only reason we've been tasked is to kind of scrape up the mess at the bottom. So we, we didn't have great hopes. Using only the steering yoke to descend and the throttle to control his speed, John aims the plane towards the unlit runway. I couldn't see what height was, and I just couldn't position myself. He can see almost nothing in the gloom. I was looking for the runway, but I couldn't see a thing. It was virtually a black tarmac runway with a black background. I don't know how high it was. John is being guided down. Slowly. Just come down gently. But inside the cockpit, he fears he's got no chance of landing on the darkened strip. I couldn't see it. Simple as that. I thought, well, I'm never going to make a landing on this one. I just saw a black line in the black dark. <laughs> John's doubts about the wisdom of attempting a landing on the unlit runway have led him to bail out. And I was thinking all sorts of things. Sod them, I'll no good coming here. Um, I just didn't know what to do. That was a bit of a bolshy mood then. Yeah, cursing myself, really, because I couldn't do it. The short runway has proved too dark for John to land on. Air traffic control need a new plan. They make the decision to attempt a landing on the main fully lit runway. I think it very quickly became apparent that the short runway wasn't going to work for him. Air traffic and the instructor had decided that the main runway was the best option, um, which is a lot bigger runway and it's lit. So there's a wee bit more hope that, yes, there is a bit of a crosswind, but at least he can see where he's going. But John's real problems have only just begun. The light just went so quick. Obviously, it went no quicker than it normally goes. But when you're really wanting it, please slow down. And it just seemed to just, it was like somebody switched the lights off. It just went. Okay. Uh, John, this is uh, just helicopter rescue on the right-hand side. Uh, OK, Roger. Roger, um, we're flying at uh, 70 miles an hour. Are you in a position to tell us what your um, speed speedometer is saying? Sorry, I can't see at all now. Because it's dark, I can't see what position I'm at. I couldn't even see what speed I was going at. I could just see the occasional flashing lights of the helicopter, but that's my lot. Go and sit in your car at night time and don't switch any lights on. That's what I could see. From an airmanship point of view, flying in the dark without being able to see any of your instruments would be horrendous for us. And we're trained in all sorts of emergencies. And we just wouldn't do that. You're looking at a huge uh, difference between flying in the day and flying at night. You can look one way, look the next way, and then look straight ahead again, and you're flying in a different direction. The wings have tipped over, and you think you're flying straight, but in fact, you're, you're turning or you're banking into the ground. It's, it's hard enough during the day when you're learning to fly as well. In John's situation, he couldn't even see the speeds to fly. So he's almost, to some extent, flying blind. 
I was trying to keep as calm as possible because if I didn't, I would lose everything. Um, and, you know, I wanted to live. Um, I wanted to get back down. I wanted to go out that night to meet Stephen Gray and Torres. Um, so I had to get down. John Wildey is circling in the sky above Humberside Airport. Since his ordeal began, he has his first bit of luck. The crosswind has dropped, making it safer to attempt a landing on the main runway. The plan is for the RAF helicopter to guide him round. Are you still following us? Oh, OK, you can see us, yeah? Yeah, roger. So I was following them. Um, that was the idea. But I couldn't see them. I saw them at first, and then I lost them. In the pitch black, John can barely make out the lights of the Sea King helicopter. And there's a real danger that if he gets too close, turbulence from it could destabilize the plane. It's pretty early. It's pretty close to us. Yeah, I'll follow you. I'll do my best. Okay. Oh, it's pretty close. Lost him now. Oh, no, I've got him. He's in about our half past five. Slightly low. It was dark. I just had reflected light from outside. That was all. And that was all very much. Um, I just couldn't see anything. The RAF pilot's doing a tremendous job. He's got to try and fly it, keep everybody in sight, but she daren't be level with him in front of him because everything going backwards would throw the, the Cessna. It's been almost one hour since John was forced to take sole control of the aeroplane. Although all the odds are against him surviving, his concern is still with his dead friend. Just to let you know, if anything goes wrong, the pilot said he felt sick. It stopped, got clipped there. You probably just let go of the back. Yeah. And he then, breathing heavy, asked me to take control, which I did. Um, yeah, it's a bit lump in the throatish, but, uh, I was worried that uh, if I was wrong and he wasn't dead, that they might ignore him completely. And that he was the important person. And uh, I was just... The, 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 so the medics, when they got to him, they knew roughly what to look for, what life signs and what was might be wrong. Um, and then he... Uh, uh, seemed all right, but then he started breathing and deeply and sweating. I think it was a mark of the man that he was still concerned about his friend. And he was able, with everything else going on, to give us a reasonable set of signs and symptoms that his friend had suffered. The RAF are now worried that John is becoming distracted by his concerns for his friend and that he needs support. He was obviously quite concerned about him, and I think he started getting a bit emotional. Yeah, yeah we better advise speak to him. I think he's a girl, or do you think that one? Yeah, maybe. Is that a calming voice? Yeah, it could do, yeah. yeah. That's perfect. That's a good yeah, idea. Hi, John, it's Decker. I'm the captain. I'm flying the helicopter you're following. Uh, our paramedics have understood all that, but don't worry about your passenger. If you just follow us onto the runway, and then once you're on the ground, we'll get your, pass or your pilot sorted out. But if you just follow us for now, and then we'll worry about him when you're on the ground. Roger, thank you. I don't know if it's true, whether having a, a girl's voice, a female voice, might kind of be calming to him. And that was our kind of theory and our reasoning. Well, it was a comfort, because I knew they were there. I know they couldn't have done anything to my position per se, but at least I knew that if something went wrong, they'd be on, on top of me like a dose of salts and the, there'd be some sort of help there. There is now a real concern that if John crashes the plane, he's flying near roads, towns, and most worryingly of all, Immingham, Britain's third largest oil refinery. I was over at Immingham, and I thought, God, if I land on that lot, there's going to be mayhem. So you could have been talking of a catastrophic um, crash and, and, and fire which is your worst nightmare. The fire is, is, is the thing that you don't want. 
But yeah, that, that was a, a distinct possibility. In complete darkness, John is now struggling to keep the plane flying. We don't want him stalling, going too slow, and he just drops out of the sky. That's, that, was the, that was the big concern. I think I didn't have enough power to climb, and I was trying to climb at the same time. And the port wing, the left wing, dropped right down. And then I was suddenly facing the ground. It was coming up round and round. And the lights of, I don't know, it must have been the, the um, airport going round me. And then they saw it. I straightened it out and then climbed again. That was about the worst time for me the whole trip, um, because I just didn't, I didn't seem to be in control at all. Just watch your height a minute, John. You're getting down to about 800 feet, but like up to about 1,000 possible. So turn right slightly and join downwind of the well-lit runway. Yeah, sorry about that. Something went wrong. It just suddenly died to the left. No, don't worry about it. You say that. It's what I did, mate. I definitely think I'd lost control of the plane at that stage. Air traffic control and the RAF now face a major challenge to line John up for his approach to the main fully lit airport runway. Keep turning right until you've got the centre line dead on your nose. No matter what colour the, the lights are on the side of the runway, whether the white or the red. There is one simple but effective landing system that could save his life. Most runways have so-called pappy lights, a system that tells a pilot whether they're too high or too low. Four red lights indicate to him that he's too low for a safe landing, and John risks crashing into the runway. But four white lights indicate he's too high and he will overshoot. There were four white lights, which I think they call pappy lights. I was focusing on the runway still, but I sort of got the peripheral, the four white lights. But at that stage, I didn't know what it meant. Right, we've got four whites. You want two of those, the, the two right-hand ones you want red, and the two left-hand ones you want white. With the best will in the world, um, he turned at the right height, but then he's coming in too high. That's why he could see four white lights. The RAF crew can see that he's not set up correctly for a landing. Oh, it's well high. It's too high. He was coming in too high, which we could see. Oh, this is going Can to you give an I was very frightened for him. I personally didn't think there was any way he was going to be able to get it on the ground. But in the cockpit, John believes he's OK. I was just concentrating. I didn't really feel anything. I was just trying to make the most of it. Air traffic control try to correct his angle of descent. You're just slightly off the centre line, Roy's going to speak to you now. Hi, John, can you hear me now? Can you take your power off, John, and come down nice and slowly? But John is powering the Cessna towards the runway, unaware he's still coming in too high and too steep. I thought, well, they're white. They're good, so I might be OK. I was just concentrating, trying to do the best I could. That's all I could think of, getting it down. John is too high to be able to bring the plane down in time. Yeah, he's about 100 feet over the threshold now. And air traffic control order him to bail out of the attempted landing. Oh, you better go around, John. Full power, go around. Oh, he's overshooting. Sorry. Oh, don't worry. For the second time, John has failed to land the plane. Seventy-seven-year-old John Wildy has been in sole control of the plane for over an hour. It's pitch black, and he's failed to land it 
on both of his two attempts. Expletive deleted. <laughs> I want to get round again and get down. I think I'm getting a bit bored now. There's people who land planes in the dark all day long and nobody thinks anything of it. And here's me cocking it up every time. <laughs> John has shown remarkable skill to keep airborne, but time is now turning against him. There was a, a, a heightened state of awareness and readiness now creeping around everybody because, well, how much longer can this, you know? There's only a finite amount of time. If nothing else, we'll run out of fuel. Air traffic control believe the plane has sufficient fuel, but John has no idea how much he has left. You don't generally fly around with five hours of fuel kind of in case. If he had overshot and gone downwind and suddenly run out of fuel, then there would have been no chance. Acutely aware of the growing urgency, the only option air traffic control have is to try John for another landing on the main runway. Every time he was lining up for an approach, it just dawned on us all how difficult this was going to be. There's so many things that could go wrong, and any one of them could have been disastrous. So it, it was just, oh, it was horrendous. Every approach he made, I think we were all terrified each time. John's last attempt failed because he came in too high. This time, everyone is focused on keeping him low enough to land safely. So you're yeah. looking out to your right hand window, can you see the wrong way? Yeah, I have it on my nose. Right, okay, this time I just would like to slow it down a little bit as you come down the approach. Roy was trying to encourage him to slow down and descend a wee bit. I'm holding the yoke here um, with one hand, and the other hand is on the throttle control. This time it looks like he's set up correctly for landing. It's coming down, and, and with about a mile to go, it, it didn't look bad, you know, because you're giving it sort of like that, that, yeah, that looks, that looks something. But in his attempt to keep low, John has overdone it, and he's starting to dive. And then all of a sudden it's, oh, no, that's a bit low. Just flatten it up a little bit, John, put a bit of power on. Pull it down a little bit. He's uh, going for the wrong way right, now. Put a bit of power on, you're sinking a little bit. It's a power on. Power on. John is losing altitude fast. He's coming in way too low. Well, landing short is not an option because you've got the main road going straight in front of it. He's heading straight for the road adjacent to the runway. Roy Murray knows he's got to gain height quickly. All power, all power. I never bring the power back. Lippers had power up, so I pushed the throttle back in and pushed the stick back. Two top, two top. Round we go again. All right, Get go round again, doesn't matter. Get height. John has pulled out of the landing just in time. Good practice. Air traffic control try to reassure him and keep him calm. That was a good approach, but he just slightly at uh, high speed on the uh, on the final part. It's what they call panic. Yeah, fair enough. I probably was panicking, wouldn't you? <laughs> After three failed landings and over an hour in the air. Everybody is now desperate for John to get down safely. The uh, runway light's too bright for you. No, they were just right. Just right. Okay. Down on me. Come on, guys. Come on, John. Come on, John. Second. It's just my dry mouth that's not. Come on, we can take the demo. I could have paid a million quid for a drink at that time. <laughs> I was gagging for a drink. Um, I think it was the adrenaline kicking in, probably. But I was so dry, it hurt. Five, two, three, four, nine, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
On the ground, the air traffic control team know there's a limit to the 77-year-old's power of endurance. I was slightly concerned that he was overloaded with work because he had been up there about an hour and a half. Uh, so I knew he would be getting, not tired, but overloaded now, thinking, you know, how long am I going to get this? You know, when's he going to get me on the ground sort of thing? He must have had thought of that in the back of his mind. Is he starting to lose concentration? Maybe he's starting to think some other, other thoughts other than a successful outcome. So you're thinking, you've got to get him down on the ground as soon as possible. We were getting close to the crunch. You can keep going around in circles for as long as you want, but at some point, it's got to come down. He's going to be tired, he's going to be exhausted, and then some of the fundamentals that he was carrying out, he would lose. So it was time to sort of like say that this is it. Let's do it. At 7.26 p.m., two hours after he took off to return from his day out, John begins his approach for his fourth attempt at a landing. Well, I've been feeling vulnerable since it started, um, but I wasn't going to let it get over me. I was going to do my best. I was determined to finish it and get it done with. I was determined to make an approach and do a landing. Um, I wasn't going to let that beat me. It was definitely Team John. He's, you know, he's got a good sense of humour and he's got compassion and he's still remarkably got his wits about him and isn't panicking. I would have given anything to get him down safely. Right, it's at 2,000 feet and climbing at the moment, so just take your power off, John, and just level it off at the moment and we'll get to come down a bit uh, lower soon. It's very difficult to work out whether each approach was giving him a wee bit more confidence or giving him a bit more terror. Can you see the green lights? Right, right, when you turn on the final approach, just tell me if you can see the two reds and two whites. This is the left-hand side of the runway, or the, the way down the runway. Could you want to aim to touch down by those? Not too hard. I can see four lights on the left-hand side. Yeah, what colour are they? Four whites. Right, you want just lower your nose then, so you've got two reds and two whites, and then level off. Not too much of a erratic movement on the control, but... He's just dived down now. I brought her down to do the approach, and that's when they said he was diving now. I just thought, well, it's going, it's going down, I'm doing it. You know, just, this is it, get, get down. No, come down a little bit. Take your power off and come down slightly. Yeah, it's at this bit, he goes down too quick. John's coming in at 80 miles per hour, half a mile from the runway road. Yeah. Good approach. Come down a bit more. Come down a bit more, John. What's the matter if he overshoots? Keep coming down. Bring your power off. Keep coming down. As John crosses the road in front of the runway, he's past the point of no return. If he's to land the plane, it's now or never. You're worried for him, and you know this is the make or break moment. This is either going to end wonderfully or it's going to end horrifically in a second. Keep coming down. Power off. Power off, you're over the road. And we can do nothing more for him now ourselves. He has to do this himself, and all we can do is just keep positive and really root for him. About all the way back, looking nice, looking good. Keep coming down. Keep down the white centre line. Getting it down, that's all I could think of. Take your back off, please. Now, clear. Just on the final bit, I did the thing I should never have done. I looked down to look at the runway when I should have been concentrating in front of me. At the very last moment, John seems to have lost control of the plane. Back. Come on, son. And then she bounced, and I thought, oh, God, not again. And then she was on. He's bouncing, but he's touching it. off, please. Spots on the runway, so he's taxing off the runway. Don't want to do that in a hurry again. <laughs> okay, he's on the grass. So we're looking for one casualty. Then she suddenly swerved away and stopped. There you go, you made it. Well done. Job, that's your first night landing. Finally, after an hour and 15 minutes at the controls, John has done the seemingly impossible and landed the plane. The 
blue lights came on and they shot across the uh, airfield. I knew he'd, he was on the ground then. And that was it, job done. It was, uh, it was, it was brilliant. It was wonderful to make, get him down safely. And who cares if it's in a field? It's fine. He's fine. I think it's fantastic what, what he achieved. His strength of character got him through it. He could have quite easily said, yeah, sod it. That's it. But no, he wanted to carry on. And so with everybody else's help, he was able to walk away. I was just in a lucky state at the time, probably, and my optimism kept me going. And I'm a pretty lucky bloke anyway, because I went and bought a lottery ticket that week and got £6.70, so that must be something must be wrong. Next Thursday on 4, we get access to the entire adoption process of children in the UK. From the birth parents to the adopters and everything in between, 15,000 kids and counting is on at 9. And over on More 4, find out more about the murky underbellies of finance, politics and the media in the brand new series Mammon, starting tomorrow at 9. 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown is next.